This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bashar of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapters 39 through 40. Chapter 39. Wherein the captive relates his life and adventures. My family had its origin in a village in the mountains of Lyon, and nature has been kinder and more generous to it than fortune. Though in the general poverty of those communities my father passed for being even a rich man, and he would have been so in reality had he been as clever in preserving his property as he was in spending it. This tendency of his to be liberal and profuse he had acquired from having been a soldier in his youth, for the soldier's life is a school in which the niggard becomes free-handed and the free-handed prodigal, and if any soldiers are to be found who are misers, they are monsters of rare occurrence. My father went beyond liberality and bordered on prodigality, and a disposition by no means advantageous to a married man who has children to, to succeed his name and position. My father had three, all sons, and all of sufficient age to make choice of a profession. Finding that, that he was unable to resist his propensity, he resolved to divest himself of the instrument and cause of his prodigality and lavishness, to divest himself of wealth, without which Alexander himself would have seemed parsimonious, and so calling us all three aside one day into a room, he addressed us in words somewhat to the following effect. My sons, to ensure you that I love you, no more need be known or said than that you are my sons, and to encourage a suspicion that I do not love you, no more is needed than the knowledge that I have no self-control as far as preservation of your patrimony is concerned. Therefore, that you may for the future feel sure that I love you like a father, and have no wish to ruin you like a stepfather, I propose to do with you what I have for some time back me meditated, and after mature deliberation decided upon. You are now of an age to choose your line of life, or at least make choice of a calling that will bring you honor and profit when you are older. And what I have resolved to do is divide my property into four parts. Three I will give to you, to each his portion without making any difference, and the other I will retain to live upon and support myself for whatever remainder of life heaven may be pleased to grant me. But I wish each of you on taking possession of the share that falls to him to follow one of the paths I shall indicate. In this Spain of ours there is a proverb, to my mind very true, as they all are, being short aphorisms drawn from long practical experience. The one I refer to says, the church, or the sea, or the king's house, as much as to say, in plainer language, whoever wants to flourish and become rich, let him follow the church, or go to sea, adopting commerce as his calling, or go into the king's service in his household, for they say, Better a king's crumb than a lord's favour. I say so, because it is my will and pleasure that one of you should follow letters, another trade, and the third serve the king in the wards, for it is a difficult matter to gain admission to his service and in his household, and if war does not bring much wealth, it confers great distinction and fame. Eight days hence I will give you your full shares in money, without defrauding you of a farthing, as you will see in the end. Now, tell me if you are willing to follow out my idea and advice as I have laid it before you. Having called upon me as the eldest to answer, I, after urging him not to strip himself of his property, but to spend it all as he pleased, we were young men able to gain our living, consented to comply with his wishes, and said that mine were to follow the profession of arms, and thereby serve God and my king. My second brother, having made the same proposal, decided upon going to the Indies, embarking the portion that fell to him in trade. The youngest, and in my opinion the wisest, said he would rather follow the church, or go to complete his studies at Salamanca. As soon as we had come to an understanding and made choice of our professions, my father embraced us all, and in the short time he mentioned, carried into effect all he had promised, and when he had given to each a share, which as well as I remember was three thousand ducks apiece in cash, for an uncle of ours bought the estate and paid for it down, not to let it go out of the family. We all three on the same day took leave of our good father, and at the same time, as it seemed to me inhuman to leave my father with such scanty means in his old age, I induced him to take two of my three thousand ducats, as the remainder would be enough to provide me with all a soldier needed. My two brothers, moved by my example, gave him each a thousand ducats, so that there was left for my father four thousand ducats in money, besides three thousand, the value of the portion that fell to him, which he preferred to retain in land instead of selling it. Finally, as I said, we took leave of him, 
and our uncle whom i have mentioned not without sorrow and tears on both sides they charging us to let them know whenever an opportunity offered how we fared whether well or ill we promised to do so and when he had embraced us and given us his blessing one set out for salamanca the other for seville and i for alicante where i had heard there was a Gen genoese vessel taking in a cargo of wood for genoa it is now some twenty-two years since i left my father's house and all that time though i have written several letters i have had no news whatever of him or my brothers my own adventures during that period i will now relate briefly i embarked at alicante reached genoa after a prosperous voyage and proceeded thence to milan where i provided myself with arms and a few soldiers accoutrements thence it was my intention to go and take service in piedmont but as i was already on the road to alessandria de la paglia i learned that the duke of alva was on his way to flanders i changed my plans joined him served under him in the campaigns he made was present at the deaths of the counts egmont and horn and was promoted to be ensign under a famous captain of guadalajara diego de urbina by name some time after my arrival in flanders news came of the league that his holiness pope pius v of happy memory had made with venice and spain against the common enemy the turk who had just then with his fleet taken the famous island of cyprus which belonged to the venetians a loss deplorable and disastrous it was known as a fact that the most serene don john of austria natural brother of our good king don philip was coming as commander-in-chief of the allied forces and rumours were abroad of the vast warlike preparations which were being made oh it stirred my heart and filled me with a longing to take part in the campaign which was expected and though i had reason to believe in almost certain promises that on the first opportunity that presented itself i should be promoted to captain i preferred to leave all and betake myself as i did to italy and it was my good fortune that don john had arrived at genoa and i and was going to naples to join the venetian fleet as he di afterwards did at messina i say in short that i took part in that glorious expedition promoted by this time to be a captain of infantry to which honourable charge my good luck rather than my merits raised me and that day so fortunate for christendom because then all the nations of the earth were disabused of the air which they lay in imagining the turks to be invincible on sea on the da that day i say on which the ottoman pride and arrogance were broken among all that were there made happy for the christians who died that day were happier than those who remained alive and victorious i alone was miserable for instead of the for instead of some naval crown that i might have expected had it been in roman times or the night that followed that famous day i found myself with fetters on my feet and manacles on my hands it happened in this way elucoli the king of the algiers a daring and successful corsair having attacked and taken the leading maltese galley only three knights being left alive in it and they badly wounded the chief galley of john andrea on board of which i and my company were placed came to its relief and doing as was bound to do in such a case i leaped on board the enemy's galley which shearing off from that which had attacked it prevented my men from following me and so i found myself alone in the midst of enemies who were in such numbers that i was unable to resist in short i was taken covered with wounds elucali as you know sirs made his escape with his entire squadron and i was left a prisoner in his power the only sad being among so many filled with joy and the only captive among so many free for there were fifteen thousand christians all at the oar in the turkish fleet that regained their long for liberty that day they carried me to constantinople where the grand turk made my master-general at sea for having done his duty in battle and carried off as evidence of his bravery the standard of the order of malta the following year which was the year seventy two i found myself at navarino rowing in the leading galley with the three lanterns there i saw and observed how the opportunity of capturing the whole turkish fleet in harbour was lost for all the marines and janissaries that belonged to it made sure that they were about to be attacked inside that very harbour and had their kits and pa pasamaks or shoes ready to f flee at once on shore without waiting to be assailed and so great fear did they stand of our fleet but heaven ordered it otherwise not for any fault or neglect of the general who commanded on our side but for the sins of christendom and because it was god's will and pleasure that we should always have instruments of punishment to chastise us as it was elucali took refuge at modon which is an island near navarino and landing forces fortified the mouth of the harbour and waited quietly until john don john retired on this expedition was taken the galley called the prize whose captain was the son of the famous corsair barbarossa it was taken by the chief neapolitan galley called the she-wolf commanded by that thunderbolt of war that father of his men that successful and unconquered captain don alvaro de bazan marquis of santa cruz and i cannot 
help telling you what took place at the capture of the prize. The son of Barbarossa was so cruel and treated his slaves so badly that when those who were at the oars saw the she-wolf galley was bearing down upon them and gaining upon them, they all at once dropped their oars and seized their captain, who stood on the stage at the end of the gangway, shouting to them to row lustily, and passing him on from bench to bench, from the poop to the prow, they so bit him that before he got much past the mass his soul had already gone to hell, so great, as I said, was the cruelty with which he treated them and the hatred with which they hated him. We returned to Constantinople the following year. 73. It became known that Don John had seized Tunis and taken the kingdom for the Turks, and placed Muley Hamid in possession, putting an end to the hopes with which Muley Hamida, the cruelest and bravest Moor in the world, entertained of returning to reign there. The Grand Turk took the loss greatly to heart, and with cunning which all his race possessed, he made peace with the Venetians, who were much more eager for it than he was. And the following year, 74, he attacked Goleta in the fort which Don John had left half built near tunis while all these events were occurring i was laboring at the oar without any hope of freedom at least i had no hope of attaining it by ransom for i was firmly resolved not to write to my father telling him of my misfortunes at length the galetta fell and the fort fell before which places there were seventy-five thousand regular turkish soldiers and more than four thousand moors and arabs from all parts of africa and in the train of all this great host such munitions and engines of war and so many pioneers that with their hands they might have covered the Goletta and the fourth with handfuls of earth. The first to fall was the Goletta, until then reckoned impregnable, and it fell not by any fault of his defenders, who did all they could and should have done, but because experiment proved how easily entrenchments could be made in the de desert sand there, for water used to be found at two palm steps, while the Turks found none at two yards, and so by means of a quantity of sa sandbags they raised their work so high that they commanded the walls of the fort, sweeping them as if from a cavalier, so that no one was able to make a stand or maintain the defence. It was a common opinion that our men should not have shut themselves up in the Goletta, but should have waited in the open at the landing-place, but those who say so talk at random and with little knowledge of such matters. For if in the Goletta and in the, and in the fort there were barely seven thousand soldiers, how could such a small number, however resolute, sally out and hold their own against numbers like those of the enemy? And how is it possible to help losing a stronghold that is not relieved above all when surrounded by a host of determined enemies in their own country. But many thought, and I thought so too, that it was a special favour and mercy which heaven showed to Spain in permitting the destruction of that source and hiding place in mischief, that devourer, sponge, and moth of countless money, fruitlessly wasted there to no other purpose save preserving the memory of its capture by the invincible Charles V, as if to make that eternal as it is and will be, these stones were needed to support it. The fort also fell, but the Turks had to win it, inch by inch, for the soldiers who defended it fought so gallantly and stoutly that the number of the enemy killed in twenty-two general assaults exceeded twenty-five thousand. Of three hundred that remained alive, not one was taken unwounded, a clear and manifest proof of their gallantry and resolution, and how sturdily they had defended themselves and held their post. A small fort or tower, which was in the middle of the lagoon, under command of Don Juan Zanugura, a Valencian gentleman and a famous soldier, capitulated upon terms. They took prisoner Don Pedro Pedro Carrero, commander of the Goleta, who had done all in his power to defend his fortress, and took the loss of it so much to heart that he died of grief on the way to Constantinople, where they were carrying him a prisoner. They also took the commander of the fort, G Gabriel Serbillon by name, a Milanese gentleman, a great engineer, and a very brave soldier. In these two fortresses perished many persons of note, among whom was Pagano Doria, knight of the order of St. John, a man of generous disposition, as was shown by his extreme liberality to his brother, the famous John Andrea Duria, and what made his death the more sad was that he was slain by some Arabs to whom, seeing that the fort was now lost, he entrusted himself, and who offered to conduct him in the guise of a moor to Tabarca, a small fort or station on the coast held by the Genoese, employed by the coral fishery. These Arabs cut off his head and carried it to the commander of the Turkish fleet, who proved on them the truth of our Castilian proverb that, though the treason may please, the traitor is ha hated, for they say he ordered those who brought him the present to be hanged for not having brought him alive. Among the Christians who were taken in, the fort was one named Don Pedro de Aguilar, a native of some place, I know not what, in Andalusia, who had been my ensign in the fort, a soldier of great repute and rare intelligence, who had in particular a special gift for what they call poetry. I say so because his fate brought him to my galley and to my bench, and made him a slave to the same master. Before we left the, the port, this gentleman composed two sonnets by way of epitaphs, one on the Goletta and the other on the fort. Indeed, I may as well repeat them, for I have them by heart, and I think they will be 
liked rather than disliked. The instant the captain mentioned the name of Don Pedro de Aguilar, Don Fernando looked at his com companions, and they all three smiled. And when he came to speak of the sonnets, one of them said, "'Before your worship proceeds any further, I entreat you to tell me what became of that Don Pedro de Aguilar you have spoken of.' "'All I know is,' replied the captive, "'that after having been in Constantinople two years, he escaped in the disguise of an Arno, in company with a Greek spy, but whether he regained his liberty or not I cannot tell, though I fancy he did, because a year afterwards I saw the Greek at Constantinople, though I was unable to ask him what the result of the journey was. "'Well, then, you are right,' returned the gentleman, "'for that Don Pedro is my brother, and he is now in our village in good health, rich, married, and with three children.' "'Thanks be to God for all the mercies he has shown him,' said Captain, "'for to my mind there is no happiness on earth to compare with recovering lost liberty. "'And what is more,' said the gentleman, "'I know the sonnets my brother made. "'Let your worship repeat them,' said the captain, "'for you will recite them better than I can. "'With all my heart,' said the gentleman, "'that on the galetta runs thus.'" End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 In which the story of the captive is continued. Sonnet Bless souls that, from this mortal husk set free, In garden of brave deeds beatified, Above this lowly orb of our ab ours abide, Made heirs of heaven and immortality, With noble rage and ardor glowing ye. Your strength, while strength was yours, in battle plied, And with your own blood in the foemen's died, The sandy soil and the encircling sea. It was the ebbing life-blood first that failed, Weary arms of stout hearts ne quelled, though vanquished yet ye earned the victor's crown, though mourned yet still triumphant was your fall, for there ye won between the sword and wall and heaven glory and on earth renown. That is exactly according to my recollection, said the captive. Well, that on the fort, said the gentleman, if my memory serves me, goes thus Up from this wasted soil, this shattered shell whose walls and towers here in ruin lie three thousand soldiers took wing on high in the bright mansions of the blessed to dwell the onslaught of the foemen to repel by might of arm all vainly did they try and when at length was left but them to die wearied and few the last offenders fell all this same arid soil hath ever been a haunt of countless mournful memories as well in our days as in days of yore but never yet to heaven it sent, I ween, for it hard bosom pure souls than these, braver bodies on its surface bore. The sonnets were not disliked, and the captive was rejoiced at the tidings they gave him of his comrade. And continuing his sale, he went on to say, The galetta and the fort thus being in their hands, the Turks gave orders to dismantle the galetta, for the fort was reduced to such a state that there was nothing left to level, and to do the work more quickly and easily they mined it in three places, but nowhere were they able to blow up the part which seemed to be the least strong, that is to say, the old walls, while all that remained standing of the new fortifications that the Fratan had made came close to the ground with the greatest ease. Finally the fleet returned victorious and triumphant to Constantinople, and after a few months died my master, El Ukali, otherwise Ukali Fartox, which means in Turkish the scabby renegade. For that he was, it, it was his, it is in the practice with Turks to name people from some defect or virtue they may possess, the reason being that there are among them only four surnames belonging to families tracing their descent from the Ottoman house, and the others, as I have said, take their names and surnames either from bodily blemishes or moral qualities. And this scabby one rode at the oar as a slave of the great seigneurs for fourteen years, and when over thirty-four years of age, in resentment at having been struck by a Turk while at the oar, turned renegade and renounced his faith in order to be able to revenge himself, and such was his valor, valor that, without owing his advancements to the base ways and means by which the most favorites of the Grand Seigneur rise to power, he came to be the king of Algiers, and afterwards general on sea, which is the third place of trust in the realm. He was a Calabrian by birth, and a worthy man morally, and he treated his slaves with great humanity. He had three thousand of them, and after his death they were divided, as he directed by his will, between the Grand Seigneur, who is heir of all who die, and shares with the children of the deceased, and his renegades. I felt of the lot of a Venetian renegade, who, when a cabin boy on board a ship, had been taken by Ukali, and was so much beloved by him that he became one of the most favored youths. He came to be the most cruel renegade I ever saw. His name was Hassan Aja, and he grew very rich and became the king of Algiers. With him I went there from Constantinople, rather glad to be so near to Spain. Not that I intended to write any one about my unhappy lot, but— 
to try if fortune would be kinder to me in algiers than in constantinople where i had attempted in a thousand ways to escape without ever finding a favourable time or chance but in algiers i resolved to seek for other means of effecting the purpose i cherished so dearly for the hope of obtaining my liberty never deserted me and when in my plots and schemes and attempts the result did not answer my expectations without giving way to despair i immediately began to look out for or conjure up some new hope to support me however faint or feeble it might be in this way i lived on immured in a building or prison called by the turks of baino in which they confine christian captives as well as those that are the kings as those belonging to private individuals and also what they call those of the almation which is as much as to say the slaves of the municipality who serve the city in the public works and other employments but captives of this kind recover their liberty with great difficulty for as they are public property and have no particular master there is no one with whom to treat for their ransom even though they may have the means to these banos as i have said some private individuals of the town are in the habit of bringing their captives especially when they are to be ransomed because there they can keep them in safety and comfort until their ransom arrives the king's captives also are that are on ransom do not go out to work with the rest of the crew unless when their ransom is delayed for them to make them right for it more pressingly they compel them to go and work for wood which is no light labour i however was one of those on ransom for when it was discovered that i was captain although i declared my scanty means and want of fortune nothing could dissuade them from including me among the gentlemen and those wanting to be ransomed they put a chain on me more as a mark of this than to keep me safe so i passed my life in that band with several other gentlemen and persons of quality marked out as held to be ransomed but though at times or rather almost always we suffered from hunger and scanty clothing nothing distressed us so much hearing and seeing at every turn the unexampled and unheard of cruelty my master inflicted upon the christians every day he hanged a man impaled one cut off the ears of another all with so little provocation or so entirely without any that the turks acknowledged he did it merely for the sake of doing it and because he was by nature murderously disposed toward the whole human race the only one that fared at all well with him was a spanish soldier something de saavedra by name to whom he never gave a blow himself or ordered a blow to be given or addressed a hard word although he had done things that will dwell in the memory of the people there for many a year and all to recover his liberty and for the least of the many things he did we all dreaded he would be impelled and he himself was in fear of it more than once and only that time does not allow i could tell you now of something of what that soldier did that would interest and astonish you more than the narration of my own tale to go on with my story the courtyard of our prisons was overlooked by the windows of the house belonging to a wealthy moor of position and these as is usual in moorish houses were rather loopholes and windows and besides were covered with thick and close lattice-work it so happened then as i was one day on the terrace of our prison with three other comrades trying to pass away the time how far we could leap with our chains we being alone for all the other christians had gone to work i chanced to raise my eyes and from one of these little closed windows i saw a reed appear with a cloth attached to one end of it and it kept waving to and fro and moving as if making signs to us to come and take it we watched it and one of those who were with me went and stood under the reed to see whether they would let it drop or what they would do but as he did so the reed was raised and moved from side to side as if they meant to say no by a shake of the head the christian came back and it was again lowered making the same movement as before another of my comrades meant and with went and with him the same happened as with the first and then the third went forward but with the same result as the first and second seeing this i did not like to try my luck and as soon as i came under the reed it was dropped and fell inside the bano at my feet i hastened to untie the cloth in which i perceived a knot and in this were ten cianus which were the coins of base gold current among the war moors and each worth ten reals of our money it is needless to say that i rejoice at this godsend and my joy was not less than my wonder as i strove to imagine how this good fortune could have come to us but to me especially for the evident unwillingness to drop the reed for any but me showed that it was for me the favour was intended i took my welcome money broke the reed and returned to the terrace and looking up at the window i saw a very white hand put out that opened and shut very quickly from this we gathered or fancied that it must be some woman living in the house that had done us this kindness and to show that we were grateful it we made salaams after the fashion of the moors bowing the head and bending the body and crossing the arms on the breath shortly afterwards at the same window a small cross made of reeds was put out and immediately withdrawn the sign led us to believe that some 
Christian woman was a captive in the house, and that it was she who had been so good to us. But the whiteness of the hand and the bracelets we had perceived made us dismiss that idea, though we thought it might be one of the Christian renegades whom their masters very often take as lawful wives, and gladly, for they preferred them to the women of their own nation. And all our conjectures were wide of the truth, so from that time forward our sole occupation was watching and gazing at the window where the cross had appeared to us, as if it were our pole star, but at least fifteen days passed without our seeing either it or the hand, or any sign, and, though meanwhile we endeavoured with the whole utmost pains to ascertain who it was that lived in the house, and whether there were any Christian renegade in it, nobody could tell ever us anything more than that he who lived there was a rich moor of high position, Haji Murata by name, formerly al of Lapata, an office of dignity high among them. But when we least thought it was going to rain any more Shianas from that corner, we saw the reed suddenly appear with another cloth tied in a larger knot attached to it, and this at a time when on former occasion the baino was deserted and unoccupied. We made a trial as before, each of the same three going forward before I did, but the reed was delivered to none but me, and on my approach it was let to drop. I untied the knot, and I found forty Spanish gold crowns without a paper written with a paper written in Arabic, and at the end of the writing there was a large cross drawn. I kissed the cross, took the crowns, and returned to the terrace, and we all made our salams. Again the hand appeared. I made signs that I would read the paper, and then the window was closed. We were all puzzled, though filled with joy at what had taken place, and, as none of us understood Arabic, great our curiosity was to know what the paper continued, and still greater the difficulty of finding someone to read it. At last I resolved to confide in a renegade, a native of Murcia, who professed a gr very great friendship for me, and had given pledges that bound him to keep any secret I might entrust to him. For it is the custom with some renegades, when they intend to return to Christian territory, to carry about them certificates from captives of Mark, testifying in whatever form they can that such and such a renegade is a worthy man, who has always shown kindness to Christians, and is anxious to escape on the first opportunity that may present itself. Some obtain these testimonials with good intentions, others put them to a cunning use, so when they go to pillage on Christian territory, if they chance to be cast away, or taken prisoners, they produce their certificates and say that from these papers may be seen the object they came for, which was to remain on Christian ground, that it was to this end they joined the Turks in their foray. In this way they escape the consequences of the first outburst, and make their peace with the Church before it does them any harm. And when they have the chance, they return to Barbary to become what they were before. Others, however, who are, there are who, who pr procure these papers and make use of them honestly, and remain on Christian soil. This friend of mine, then, was one of these renegades that I have described. He had certificates from all our comrades, in which we testified in his favour as strongly as we could, and if the Moors had found the papers, they would have had him burned alive. I knew that he understood Arabic very well, and could not only speak, but also write it, but before I disclosed the whole matter to him, I asked him to read for me this paper, which I had found by accident in a hole in my cell. He opened it, and remained some time examining it, and muttering to himself as he translated it. I asked him if he understood it, and he told me he did perfectly well, and that if I wished him to tell him its meaning, word for word, I must give him a pen and ink, that he might do it more satisfactorily. We at once gave him what he required, and he set about translating it, bit by bit, and when he had said, and when he had done, he said, All that is here in Spanish is what the Moorish paper contains, and you must bear in mind that when it says, Leila Maria, and it means Our Lady the Virgin Mary. We read the paper, and it ran thus. When I was a child, my father had a slave who taught me to pray the Christian prayer in my own language, and told me many things about Leila Marian. The Christian died, and I know that she did not go to the fire, but to Allah, because since then I have read her, seen her twice, and she told me to go to the land of the Christians to see Leila Marian, who had great love for me. I know not how to go. I have seen many Christians, but except thyself none has seemed to be to me a gentleman. I am young and beautiful, and have plenty of money to take with me. See if thou canst contrive how we go, and if thou wilt, thou shalt be my husband there, and if thou wilt not, it will not distress me, for Leila Marian will find me some some one to marry me. I myself have written this. Have a care to whom thou givest it to read. Trust no more, for they are all perfidious. I am greatly troubled on this account, for I would not have thee confide in any one, because if my father knew it, he would at once fling me down a wall, and cover me with stones. I will put a thread to the reed, tie the answer to it, and if thou hast no one to write for thee in Arabic, tell it to me by signs, for Leila Marian will make me understand thee. She and Allah, and this cross, which I often kiss, as the captive bade me, protect thee. Judge, sirs, whether we had reason for surprise and joy at the word of this paper, and both one 
and the other were so great that the renegade perceived that the paper had not been found by chance but had been in reality addressed to some one of us and he begged us if that what he suspected were the truth to trust him and tell him all for he would risk his life for our freedom and so saying he took out from his breast a metal crucifix and with many tears swore by god the image represented in whom sinful and wicked as he was he truthfully and faithfully believed to be loyal to us and keep secret whatever we chose to reveal to him for he thought and almost foresaw that by means of her who had written that paper he and all of us would obtain our liberty and he himself obtained the object he so much desired his restoration to the bosom of the holy mother church from which by his own sin and ignorance he was now severed like a corrupt limb and the renegade said this with so many tears and such signs of repentance that with one consent we all agreed to him to tell him the whole truth of the matter and so we gave him a full account of all without hiding anything from him we pointed out to him the window at which the reed appeared and he by that means took note of the house and resolved to ascertain with particular care who lived in it we agreed also that it would be advisable to answer the moorish lady's letter and the renegade without a moment's delay took down the words i dictated to him which were exactly what i tell you for nothing of importance that took place in this affair has escaped my memory or ever will while life lasts this then was the answer returned to the moorish lady the true allah protect thee lady and that blessed mary and who is the true mother of god and who has put it into thy heart to go into the land of the christians because she loves thee entreat her that she be pleased to show thee how thou canst execute the command she gives thee for she will such is her goodness on my own part, and on that of all these Christians who are with me, I promise to do all that we can for thee, even to death. Fail not to write to me and inform thee of what thou dost mean to do, and I will always answer thee. For the great Allah has given us a Christian captive who can speak and write thy language well, as thou mayest see by this paper, without fear, therefore, thou canst inform us of all thou wouldst. As to what thou sayest, that if thou dost reach the land of the Christians, thou wilt find me my wife. I give thee my promise upon it as a good Christian, and know that the Christians keep their promises better than the Moors. Allah and Mary and his mother watch over thee, my lady. The paper being written and folded, I waited two days until the bano was empty as before, and immediately repaired to the usual walk of the terrace to see if there were any sign of the reed, which was not long in making its appearance. As soon as I saw it, although I could not distinguish it, distinguish you put it out, I showed the paper as a sign to attach the thread, but it was already fixed to the reed, and to it I tied the paper. And shortly afterwards our star once more made its appearance with the white flag of peace the little bundle it was dropped and i picked it up and found in cloth and gold and silver coins of all sorts more than fifty crowns which fifty times more strengthened our joy and doubled our hope of gaining our liberty that was very that very night our renegade returned and said he had learned that the moor who had been told that we lived in our that house that his name was haji murato that he was enormously rich and that he had only one daughter the heiress of all his wealth and that it was general opinion throughout the city that she was the most beautiful woman in barbary and that several of the viceroys who came there had sought her for a wife, but that she had always been unwilling to marry, and he had learned, moreover, that she had had a Christian slave who was now dead, all which agreed with the contents of the paper. We immediately took counsel with the grenegade as to what means would have to be adopted in order to carry off the Moorish lady and bring us all to Christian territory, and in the end it was agreed that for the present we should wait for a second communication from Zoraida, for that was the name of her who now desires to be called Maria because we saw clearly that she and no one else could find a way out of all these difficulties. When we had decided upon this, the renegade told us to be, not to be uneasy, for he would lose his life or restore us to liberty. For four days the bano was filled with people, for which reason the reed delayed its appearance for four days. But at the end of that time, when the bano was, as it generally was, empty, it appeared with a cloth so bulky that it promised a happy birth. Reed and cloth came down to me, and I found another paper and a hundred crowns in gold, without any other coin. Renegade is present, and in our cell we gave him the paper, and read, which was to this effect, I cannot think of a plan, Signor, for our going to Spain, nor has Leila Murian shown me one, though I have asked her. All that can be done is for me to give you plenty of money in gold from this window. With it, ransom yourself and your friends, and let one of you go to the land of the Christians, and there buy a vessel and come back for the others. And he will find me in my father's garden, which is at the Babazan Gate near the seashore, where I shall be all this summer with my father and my servants. You can carry me away from there by night without any danger, and bring me to the vessel. And remember, thou art to be my husband, else I will pray to marry and then punish thee. If thou canst not trust any one to go for the vessel, ransom thyself, and do thou go, for I know thou wilt return more surely than any other, as thou art a gentleman and a Christian. Endeavour to make thyself acquainted with the garden, and when I see thee walking yonder, I shall know that the bay is empty, and I will give thee abundance of money. Allah protect thee, Signor. 
These were the words and contents of the second paper, and on hearing them, each declared himself willing to be the ransom one, and promised to go in return with a scrupulous good faith, and I too made the same offer to but all this the renegade objected, saying that he would not on any account consent to one of us being sent free before all went together, as experience had taught us had taught him how ill those who have been set free keep their promises which they made in captivity, captivity, for captives of distinction frequently had recourse to this plan, paying the ransom of one who was to go back to Valencia or Majorca with money to enable him to arm a bank in return for the others who had ransomed him, but who never came back, but recovered liberty and the dread of losing it again, effaced from the memory all the obligations in the world. And to prove the truth of what he said, he told us briefly of what had happened to a certain Christian gentleman, almost at that very time, the strangest case that had ever occurred even there were astonishing and marvellous things are happening every instant. In short, he ended by saying that what he could and ought to be done was to give the money intended for the ransom of one of us Christians to him, so that he might with it buy a vessel there in Algiers under the pretense of becoming a merchant and trader to Tune and along the coast, and when the master of the vessel it would be easy for him to hit on some way of getting us all out of the bay and putting us on board, especially if the Moorish lady gave, as she said, money enough to ransom all, because once free it would be the easiest thing in the world for us to embark, even in open day. But the greatest difficulty was that the Moors do not allow any renegade to buy or own any craft unless it be a large vessel for going on roving expeditions, because they are afraid if any, that any one who buys a small vessel, especially if he be a Spaniard, wants it only for the purpose of escaping to Christian territory. This he could get over by arranging with a tiger and moor to go shares with him in the purchase of the vessel and in the profit on the cargo, and under cover of this he could become the master of the vessel in which he looked upon, all the rest is accomplished. But though to me and my comrades it had seemed a better plan to send one to Majorca for the vessel, as the Moorish lady suggested, we did not dare to oppose him, fearing that if we did not go, as he said, he would denounce us and place us in danger of losing all our lives if he were to disclose our dealings with Zoraida, for whose life he would have given all our own. We therefore resolved to put ourselves in the hands of God and in the renegades, and at the same time an answer was given to Zoraida, telling her we would do all she recommended, for she had given us good advice as if Leila Maria had delivered it, and that it depended on her alone whether we were to defer the business or to put it into execution at once. I renewed my promise to be her husband, and thus the next day, that the bay no chance to be empty, she at different times gave us by means the reed and cloth two thousand gold crowns and a paper in which she said that the next Juna, that is to say Friday, she was going to her father's garden, but that before she went she would give us more money, and if it were not enough we were to let her know, and she would come and give us as much as we asked for, for her father had so much he would not miss it, and besides he kept all the keys. We at once gave the renegade five hundred crowns to buy the vessel, and with eight hundred I ransomed myself, giving the money to a Valencian merchant who happened to be in Algiers at the time, and who had released me on his word, pledging it that on the arrival of the first ship from Valencia he would pay my ransom for if he had given the money at once it would have made the king suspect that my ransom money had been for a long time in Algiers, and that the merchant had for his own advantage kept it secret. In fact, my master was so difficult to deal with that I dared not on any account pay down the money at once. The Thursday before the Friday on which the fair Zoraida was to go to the garden, she gave us a thousand crowns more, and warned of us of her departure, begging me, if I were ransomed, to find her at her father's garden at once, and by all means seek an opportunity of going there to see her. I answered in a few words that I would do so, and that you must remember to commend us to Lila Marie, and with all the prayers of the captive had taught her. This having been done, steps were taken to ransom our three comrades, so as to enable them to quit the bano, unless seeing me ransom and themselves not, though the money was forthcoming, they should make a disturbance about it, and the devil should prompt them to do something that might injure Zoraida. For their proposition might be sufficient to relieve me from this apprehension. Nevertheless, I was unwilling to run any risk in the matter, and so I had them ransomed in the same way as I was, handing over all the money to the merchant, so that he might with safety and confidence give security, without, however, arranging our, confiding our arrangement in secret to him, which might have been dangerous. End of chapter 40